Welcome back to the Calyx channel. This is Thelma standing amongst the bromeliads here. And I'll be bringing you part two in the series, how to grow beautiful bromeliads in your garden. So please keep watching. In the first part, we introduce you to four genera that we have growing in the garden. And just to refresh your memory, we spoke about plants looking like this that have a nice pear-shaped flower. These are the ecmias, and we showed you three types last week. These are the neorigelia, and the other two types, the gosmania and the bilbergia. They're a little further away from me in the garden, but I'll point those out to you as I wander. And in part two of the series, we are going to be focusing on the maintenance activities, as well as some of the problems that could crop up if you are uh, not careful. And in the future, we're going to start with the light requirements, then go on to the watering, the nutrition, any pest problems, and we'll end up this video with quite an extensive section on how to propagate your bromeliads in your garden. So let's get going. This is um, a new planting of Ekmea. And when we started out, this area was fairly nicely shaded, but we had to prune the bougainvilleas. You can see that this, these areas were recently trimmed back. Since then, the bougainvilleas have started to come back. So I guess in another two months or so, they sh the filtered light will return. But a uh, consequence of this, these plants being exposed rather suddenly to more light, more light than they, they like, is sun scorching. There is that plant there, which I think really, that was newly planted. It had not yet established and that suffered quite a bit. All right, moving on from that area that had a little bit too much light, we have some bilbergias at the root of this banana tree. This is the tallest banana tree you've ever seen. But they've, again, they're placed there in a, old, in a holding position, and they clearly like it because some are in pots, some are just really resting on the ground, and they have continued to bloom giving me an idea that, yeah, I'm going to leave them here to expand this area. They do provide really such a nice splash of color to the extreme end of the garden. Right. And this section of the, the bromeliad collection, really they are in a bed that is rather much more exposed to sunlight than the other area we just left. The grapefruit tree, provides a fair bit of protection, of filtered light, for this side of the bed. This yellowing is highly likely due to the fact that this plant is maturing now, it is uh, done its blooming, and it has set, sent out three rather large pups. So this mother plant, the yellowing we're seeing here, is due to natural aging. But compare that root, which is in filtered light, to this one, which is more exposed to the sunlight and you see the yellowing on the leaves. The adjoining bed is also exposed to relatively bright light. It's planted with three varieties of neorigelias. The darker purple variety is showing more sun stress than the other two and will be relocated to a more protected area. Let's turn our attention to the medium in which the bromeliads are growing. Most of the bromeliads are epiphytes. They do not need soil. The roots are really primarily for support. They take in their nutrients from the air, and therefore the emphasis has to be on providing them with the kind of conditions that they're accustomed to in nature. A very porous, very well aerated mix. So even though these plants do not need to be in soil, 
We've chosen to put them in ground beds for aesthetic purposes. We want to see the blooms throughout the garden. And what I did was just to make a hole. This, this whole substrate is predominantly rocks and a lot of organic matter. So it's essentially the mulching in situ. And since this has been in, this uh, plant has been in this location about two months. It's setting out a, a pup. So it's quite comfortable, but the roots, I'm just, I don't want to disturb it too much, but these fine roots are at the surface and we've put the gravel to hold the plant in place and just keep mulching it to keep it cool. And while I'm sitting here, it's a comfortable spot to introduce the whole, the next topic of watering. Now, these bromeliads have the cup and whereas you, we should keep the roots moist and comfortable, bromeliads take in their water from the cups. I know there's a lot of discussion about the cups holding mosquitoes. I'm looking in there and I see no mosquito larvae. I have never come and handled my bromeliads and find mosquitoes rising up from the, the water in the cup. And because these are growing outdoors, the cups are replenished predominantly by rainfall. I very rarely have to water these plants. If I feel that the media is dry, I will keep the, the roots moist. The recommendation for watering your plants, whether indoor or out, outdoors, is to use rainwater. Or if you don't, if you're growing indoors, you don't have rainwater, add distilled water. So they're happy. I see nothing um, flying up from these. The cups get replenished on a regular basis by rains, or if there is an extended period, a two week period, there's no rains and the cups are, are dry. We will water and make sure the cups are filled. In terms of fertilizing your bromeliads, now bromeliads take care of themselves. In nature, you see this cup, it collects a lot of organic matter, whether from old leaves, even dust particles. And from that, the bromeliad is able to produce most of the or all of the nutrients that it needs, it also can extract nutrients from the air. So normally you would not need to fertilize your bromeliads growing outdoors. Bromeliads indoors, because they don't have the benefit of accumulating all of this good organic stuff, persons are in the habit of treating them similarly to orchids, the same mild fertilizer spray you would give your orchid can be given to your bromeliads. In terms of some of the pest problems that um, persons may be concerned about, from time to time I will see slugs and snails. I've seen snails coming out of the, the cups, but if you look, there are no sign of slug damage on the bromeliads. So they really do use the bromeliads as a house, as a nice, comfortable, cool place to come and hang out, but they go elsewhere for their food. And what I've started to do in this garden is to space what I call trap plants around the garden, such as the two angel trumpets in this area that they love. So anything that they love, I place to the end of the garden. That way I can keep an eye on them and better able to physically remove the slugs and the snails. So not a problem, does not require treatment in the bromeliads per se, because they very rarely feed on the bromeliads. And in terms of diseases, again, very few to talk about, but I just want to point out that if perchance you are applying any copper fungicide near or in your garden, try to keep them away from the bromeliads. They're very toxic. They need a drop of copper, copper fungicide on your bromeliad leaf will scorch. Next up would be propagation. But first, let me show you the materials that I'm going to be placing in the pots. I'm going to start with some gravel to anchor the pot. A handful of gravel. And this is chopped bark, tree bark. And compost, a lot of coarse organic matter is still left in it. So I'm going to proceed and fill the pots 
And then I'll proceed to propagation, which for bromeliads consists simply of separating the pups from the mother plants and planting the pups either in beds or in individual pots. I'll start with this lovely ichmere with the pink stripes. The mother has bloomed out and has produced three large, lovely pups. Let me take a look at the how the pups are attached to the mother plant to see whether it would be safe to just pry them apart. Oh no, it, it's not giving at all, so I think it's safer for me to use the roll cut. And yes, it is quite woody and taking a little effort. So I, I think we were quite right to use the roll cut to remove the pup. And here they are, three pups and the mother plant. We separated three more pups from their mother plant and proceeded to pot the pups as well as the mother plants. These pots have the layer of pebbles at the bottom, followed by a mixture of the coarse compost and the tree bark. So potting is simply just placing the, the pup in a small depression and using the tree bark to keep it upright. And then I'll just top, the, top it off with a handful of the coarse compost and firm everything in place. I'll do the others, then water. Our propagation activity resulted in these seven newly potted bromeliads. This mother plant gosmania had a rather large pup and the new pup is looking very comfortable in its own pot. We also separated the pup from the ecmia that was getting rather overcrowded alongside its mother in a pot. And here are the rather large pups from that one single ecmia plant. So you see, propagation pays and we're just doing this to expand the materials available to us as we design the garden and add new features. And this is what we are proposing that you two can do. So we've come to the end of this two-part series on bromeliads in which we introduced the main popular types in this garden. And we also covered the main aspects of growing any plants in your garden, which are the lighting requirements, the growing media, the fertilizing, the watering, and for those of us who want more plants, propagation. And by now you recognize that growing bromeliads is relatively easy compared to other plants. And the propagation aspect in particular, all you have to do is pop off the pups and put them in a pot. And after a while, with very little subsequent care, you have wonderful bromeliads such as these. If you like this video, please give us a thumbs up, share it with your friends, and if you haven't subscribed already, please, we encourage you to do so, so you won't miss any of our new videos as we release them at the end of each week. So until the next video, I am Thelma, sitting amongst my newly expanded Mobiliad collection, saying bye-bye.